We're back to the Richard Spassoff Show. It's brought to you by Audible. You can find us on our website at the Psychic Medium Spassoff Show dot com. Also, the Richard Spassoff Show is a podcast member of the HC Universal Network family. And you can find uh, HC Universal Network family on Androids and coming soon iDevices. To get all the great stuff from the Richard Spassoff Show and more, check out the HC Universal website, please. Also, I'd like to give a big thank you to TalkStream Live for bringing us aboard their website. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Bill. We have a fantastic guest coming up. But before we do, let's go for our commercial break. Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk Entertainment. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. And he will tell you more. I'd like to introduce to you Paul Remush. Did I pronounce that name right? Yep, that's good. Good enough. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your help, Paul, to begin with, I tell you. And thank you for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure to be with you and your listeners tonight. This is awesome. Thank you. Now, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you got started in this uh, adventure? Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of journey, and uh, I mean, a little bit about myself. So I, uh, I graduated from Weber State University in 1997 with a degree in forensic science. And since then, so for almost 22 years, I have been working as a crime scene investigator for the Weber Metro uh, Crime Scene Investigation Unit. And um, for those of you who are familiar with northern Utah, that's in Ogden, Utah. That's a city about 50 miles north of Salt Lake. It's one of the bigger cities in kind of extreme northern Utah. And, uh, yeah, so since then I've been uh, involved in uh, investigating crimes and in forensic science and different things like that. And a, a lot of people, as I've shown my interest in ghost stories and different things and and then even went on to write my book, which we'll talk about. A lot of people have kind of questioned. They're like, oh, well, how can you, a person who studied science in college and uh, work in a field where you're interested in facts and evidence and different things like that, how can you be interested in the paranormal? And my answer to that is always pretty simple, that um, I was trained to go where the evidence goes and not have any preconceived notions. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really dangerous for a person in investigations or forensics to have uh, what is called the anchoring fallacy, where you have your theory or the limited set of facts that you have in the beginning and that you become anchored to that and that you don't let go of that. That is very dangerous. That's how innocent people end up in prison. Mm -hmm. That's how lives are ruined. You know, in yeah. my business, you've got to follow where the evidence goes. And so that being said, you know, there are things that happen to people that cannot be explained away. Paranormal things. 
Now, not everything that happens to people who, you know, claim to have seen a ghost or Bigfoot or whatever, not everything is probably true. Correct. You know, I mean, some people, some people may have misidentified something. Some people might have been under the influence of something. I mean, there's a lot of things, but there is always a percentage of things that happen to some people that you can't just readily dismiss. Right. And you're talking about a lot of outside variables that you don't know what could cause certain things. I mean, and, and for, first of all, I'm fascinated with what you do. Secondly, uh, if I ever find a dead body, can I bring it to you? Sure. Okay. Good. <laughs> might, might have getting it. You might have trouble getting it past uh, TSA or whatever. <laughs> I know, but maybe if I could train the guy to talk, that would work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Weekend at Bernie's kind of a thing, maybe. <laughs> no, I'm I'm happy to have you here. It sounds great. Uh, continue on, please. Okay, and so I I ever since I was a little kid, I mean I loved campfire stories and I love mystery and things that can't be explained. I mean, I watched um, the different shows, you know, in search of and unsolved mysteries. And I mean, I just, I just love that. And I think it's actually one of the, one of the beautiful things of life that there is mystery out there and things we don't understand. Yes, and yes. It's one of, yeah, I, I can't imagine um, not, having that wonder and awe and mystery at some things in life. I think it would be pretty bleak, but I guess that's just me. But, but anyway, so, um, as I, you know, start my career in law enforcement and, you know, young CSI taking things very seriously and, and, you know, trying to build my career. One of the things that I really enjoyed from the beginning and still do about law enforcement is the storytelling culture in mm -hmm. it. And, and, you know, some of the stories, obviously, you know, I wouldn't want to tell to my mother and different things like right, that. Right, right, yes. You know, there, <laughs> there's, you know there's, there's, some, there's some bad stuff. But um, there's always a lot of downtime. I mean, on the TV forensic shows, they always have, you know, there's always action mm -hmm. and people running around doing stuff. Well, in real life, there's tons of time where you're just sitting on your hands waiting for something to happen. Now, that could be... You're at a crime scene and you're waiting for a judge to sign a search warrant. Mm -hmm, and sometimes mm -hmm. that can take a couple hours or you're at the courthouse waiting to testify and you've been there all morning or, or you're, you're working a night shift and no calls are coming in and there's nothing really to do. It's not like we can go make crime happen, you know, Right. right. No. I guess we could, but we wouldn't last. No, before. no. Um, but anyway, so there's lots of time to tell stories and I just, I love that. I mean, it just, that part of my job harkens back to my love of campfire stories that I had from when I was a child. And so, you know, there's lots of different varieties of stories, you know, dangerous things that have happened or, you know, funny stuff, you know, all this stuff. But I started to like and ask people about weird stuff that had happened to them. And it, it started out one Halloween. It was, I don't know if it was Halloween day or just Halloween season, but I just started to ask, the different officers that I saw, like, <clears throat> hey, have you uh, ever seen a ghost story or anything that's really weird happened? And a lot of times, you know, at first they really wouldn't want to talk about it. But then when they saw that I wasn't going to make fun of them, they started to open up. And mm -hmm. I was surprised at how many uh, officers had run into things that were paranormal or strange or whatever. And so, you know, I just started to ask stories and share stories and it just, you know, kind of grew and grew that I almost had a, a repertoire of cool stories that had been told to me. And so my wife, bless her heart, was like, hey, you should write those stories down in a book. That would be a really interesting book for people to read. Good idea. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, why not? That's a good idea. All, all, most of her ideas are good. Uh, <laughs> I guess marrying me was probably her worst idea. <laughs> I'm sure she loves that, though. But hey. Well, yeah, we're uh, we're getting close to our 24th anniversary. So oh, happy she... anniversary to begin with. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, this week, in fact. So congratulations, really. Thank you. It's uh, been great. But yeah, so anyway, I just like yeah, it's a good idea. So I just slowly started to write and gather more stories and. It just came together, and the, the fruit of that labor of love is the book 
uh, Fingerprints and Phantoms. And it is available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, any of those. And uh, it, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Yeah, that y- you have quite a bit of experience, especially being a, a forensic invet- investigator in the police department. And now you add the paranormal to it, which I think is great. Uh, you have an open mind. And it gives people a chance that are scientists as well as people that aren't. They give a new. They get to understand a new perspective. Well, it's you. You really have to have an open mind in our business, like we talked about. Yes. And I, I, unfortunately, a lot of times in academia, you know, mainstream scholars, they aren't as open. But like I, we talked about in the beginning, there are certain things that happen to people that you can't just readily dismiss or explain. And let me give you an example yes. <laughs> story from, from the book. Okay. And the, the book, is, it's kind of an interesting format. The, the first part of each chapter is kind of law enforcement, uh, some of my musings on law enforcement work and forensic work in general and then it transitions there to a ghost story. So it's kind of like true CS, the life and times of the true CSI mixed with ghost stories. So it's kind of an interesting format. But um, the, the, the story that I'm about to tell you, it's one of those that if no matter how hard you try to kind of dismiss different elements of it, you'd be hard pressed to do so and still be intellectually honest. Now, it was early in my career, and we had a homicide. It was kind of an interesting morning for me. Okay. I got called out of bed to go take pictures of a guy who had crashed his car into a uh, into one of the buildings in downtown Ogden. And I went, took pictures of it, didn't really think of anything, and then I went back to bed. And then they called me out of bed a little while later and said, oh, you know that car that crashed into the building? I'm like, yeah. Oh, whoa, that guy killed his wife. Oh, <laughs> like, no. Oh, really? So anyway, we, we, you know, I get up again and we go to the crime scene and we, we spend a lot of time working this crime scene. And it, it was, it was a really violent crime scene. It's actually, I mean, it was early in my career, but um, still to this day, it's one of the most kind of bloody and violent scenes that I'd ever worked. And it was really interesting because for the first time in my career, when you would walk into that crime scene, you could feel the presence of the the dead victim. Like okay. you could feel her there. And it was so palpable that people even started to address her by name when they would walk in the apartment and say, Hi, you know, we're here again. And <laughs> you know, just kind of just kind of talk to her because things were things were so real. And, you know, this case obviously was in, you know, in the local media and it made it made the news, but there weren't a lot of the details of it that leak out to the media. Okay. And one of the details of the crime was that where she was positioned in the house that looked like she had been chased to a certain location and pinned against a door. And then she met her end right there. And like I said, the crime was in the media, but any of those details just weren't released. And so we, you know, work on that scene for a couple of weeks and, you know, it wasn't a whodunit. Uh, it was, you know, we just had to document everything and do our best to kind of prove different elements or disprove elements of his story. And so, you know, just pretty, pretty standard job. Well, anyway, um, two years later, the, the apartment's been re, refurbished it's been rented out to somebody else new people are living there and you know we've all kind of moved on well one of the officers uh who actually responded that day to the crime his name is mike and he's a great officer he's still around we really enjoy Good. working with him <laughs> and he he had been there one of the first responders the day of the murder but he was called back to that exact same apartment uh two years later for something completely unrelated. I, I think it was like an un, the, they had the people there weren't in trouble themselves. They just had to fill out a witness form or, you know, a complaint or something, you know, they weren't, they weren't, 
they weren't criminals themselves. They, you know, just had to do, you know, fill out. I can't, I think it was like an ungovernable juvenile report or something like that. Anyway, so the officer comes in there and he felt really weird walking back in those apartments. You know, he, because, you know, it's kind of flashbacks or mm-hmm. part of PTSD, unfortunately, that a lot of times when you go back to some of these places, you get these flashbacks. And yeah, remember, it's a, it, it's a very dramatic ex- experience. Yes. Right. Go, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. So, you know, he's he's feeling a little apprehensive going back there anyway because he's reliving some of the things. And But he's dealing with these people. They're nice, no problem. They fill out the report. And at the end, when Mike's getting ready to leave, the uh, the woman of the house says, Hey, um, was somebody murdered in these apartments? And when she said that to Mike, he's said he kind of felt the color drain out of his face a little bit. And he's mm-hmm. like, um, yes, yes, uh, someone was murdered in this, apar- this apartment complex. And the lady goes, whoa, which unit was it? <laughs> oh, geez, okay. And, Not to laugh at the death, but I mean, somebody just moved into the apartment and now they want right. to know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, and so um, he goes, well, are you sure you want to know? And she goes, yeah, I'd really like to know. And he's like, well... It was this unit. And, you know, he didn't know what to expect when he said that, you know, if they were going to freak out or whatever. But um, the the lady didn't really react much, but her husband was sitting on the couch and he watching TV and he goes, oh, that explains a few things. And then the matter seemed to be closed for them. <laughs> and, <laughs> Jeez. and and but Mike, you know, having been there and everything and. He's like, whoa, whoa, what do you, what do you mean? What, what are you guys talking about? And they said, oh, well, you know, just so, sometimes weird things happen in this apartment. And he's like, whoa, like what? And they said, well, um, every now and again, the light in the bathroom will turn on and the door, if it's closed, will just open up by itself. There's no draft. There's no furnace or fan running the door light will switch on and the door will just open up by itself. And they didn't seem too freaked out about it. And, but when they're describing this to Mike, we go back to the details of the crime that no one out in the public knew that was the door that she was pinned against. It was that bathroom door that we figured that she was trying to get into, but got sandwiched against it, pinned against it because it opened outward and where she met her demise. And that's the door that opens by itself. The bathroom that she was trying to get into, that's the light that turns on by itself. And when they tell this to Mike, he's really freaked out. And, you know, he leaves. He doesn't make a scene or anything, but it it just really affects him because they're telling him this, and they don't know the details of the crime, but he does. And so once again, I return to what we were talking about. How would they have known? Mm -hmm. Like, what what are the odds that they would describe through their, you know, experience with whatever's going on, the exact thing, the exact place, the exact kind of almost conditions that that were there in the crime? And so I can't I can't dismiss it just out of hand. No, you can't. I mean, come on. A door opens and and closes i mean somebody somebody wants to come in whether it's a spirit or a human right and it's the door it's not <laughs> I, know, the I know or it's the door <laughs> <laughs> and so i it was that was that was actually one of the first kind of stories that i collected that was probably the one of the first stories that i wrote for the book but it, it it's still one of the best examples of I can't tell those people that they aren't experiencing what they think they are. No, it occurs, but it's hard to explain unless they go through it themselves. Right. And, you know, what exactly is going on? Is it the spirit trying to act out in death what she couldn't do in life? Is it energy that's trapped into the building that's replaying itself like a tape recorder? I don't really get into that. I or, don't myself. Or, or being a psychic medium, could it be the ever bunny trying to close the door so he could use the bathroom? Yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I know what you're saying. You never know where the energy is co- coming from in this case. Right. And I don't, you know, even though, 
you know, I gather a lot of stories and, you know, I see kind of some patterns and trends. I don't really, you know, I'm not a paranormal investigator. I am a storyteller. You know, I, I, I kind of approach this from more a folkloric, you know, point of view mm-hmm. that I love the stories and I love the, the art of storytelling and having a story told to you, you know, but, you know, you, I, you do see certain patterns. And so, yeah, like, like I said, is it, is it actually a, the spirit of this poor girl? Who knows? Is it energy? I would say it's a spirit of, of, of the woman. Um, too bad you don't know more about her. Appar- apparently, she seems to have been stuck in that apartment. Yeah, it could be. And that that kind of concept leads us to probably the mother of all stories in the book. Okay, good, good. That should that should really give all detectives and crime scene investigators a little bit of pause because it looks like that ghosts will often attach themselves to CSIs and follow them home from crime scenes. Oh, they will. Yes. Jeez, <laughs> oh, <geez>, oh <laughs> great. <laughs> there's multiple examples and this is Okay, okay. This this story, this was probably the the genesis of really my interest in this. Okay. And so this is um, this happened to a dear, dear friend of mine. His name is Mitch. And uh, we used to work together, but he took a position at a local agency, a nearby agency, as their supervisor. And he's doing awesome. Just so proud of him. But he had probably the dooziest of all CSI paranormal experiences. Okay. And what happened is, uh, once again, it was another murder scene. And once again, a, a husband had killed their wife. Unfortunately, you're statistically way more likely to be killed by someone you you know than Mm -hmm. by a stranger. And usually you're in a domestic relationship with them. Exactly. Yes. The the stats are really sad on that. But so anyway, this, this was a girl who was uh, murdered by her husband again. And um, Mitch was a pretty young investigator at the time. And he had, he, we were all there at the scene, working the scene. It was a pretty big scene. It was a shooting. So there's kind of some multiple locations with gel casings and bullet holes and, you know, a lot of different activities that need to be done at a crime scene. And so during kind of the ebb and flow of, of all of us working and doing different things, he found himself alone in front of the female victim, in front of the wife who'd been killed. Mm-hmm. And as a young investigator – he was kind of going through, you know, learning how to how to do the job and learning how to process and learning how to think. And so as a mental exercise, he kneeled down in front of the victim and he was alone in this room with her. And he said, OK, tell me what happened to you. And he didn't really expect an answer. OK, this was just kind of a mental exercise. He was putting himself in the proper mental frame of mind to piece together what had happened. Mm-hmm. It was just it was purely a mental exercise. Right, right. Well, as soon as he says that, the lights in the room go out. And so he's sitting or he's kneeling in front of a corpse in a pitch black, a completely black room. And he's like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> he, he really, you know, <laughs> Really became kind of freaked out. I mean, not hysterical or anything, but he was, you know, heart rate up, you know, short breath, like, what just happened? Well, um, after a certain amount of time, lights pop back on, and he doesn't know if it was 10 seconds or, you know, a minute or whatever, but pretty quick, it popped back on. And, you know, he calms back down and thinks, well, that was weird. And so he goes out to the street corner. We were out. I don't know if we were taking a break or whatever, but we were outside of the house. And he comes out to us and he's like, hey, guys, uh, did you notice the lights of the house or the other houses on the block here go out? And we were like, well, no, no, the street lights, the house light, everything was fine. We didn't notice any power bump. And he's like, oh, OK, that was weird. And but then he doesn't think about it. We go back to work, a lot to do, a lot of bullet holes to document and <laughs> yeah. cases to pick up and photos to take and all the good stuff. And. And so, you know, we work on that scene for a couple of days and then we're done. 
Well, we're not exactly done, or at least Mitch isn't done, because he starts to notice really weird things happening at home. Okay. And first of all, he starts noticing that his dog is acting weird. Okay. Now, his dog was a pug, and he unfortunately that pug has gone on to pug heaven. He passed away a few oh. years ago. We actually dedicated the book to him. There's a nice picture of the of the dog in the front of the book. And his name was The Dude. <laughs> the Dude. <laughs> yeah, was, he was a great dog. He, he he always loved when we'd go over to his house because uh, if I would turn on my flashlight on the floor, he would chase it around. <laughs> he was a really funny dog. But, yeah, he was a good dog. But anyway, so, but The Dude started to act very strange. They would be sitting in downstairs watching TV and all of a sudden the dude's head would pop up and his 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 head would track and kind of follow something like there was something walking through the room, but there was nothing there. Other times he would look up in a corner, like there was something floating up in the corner and just stare at this corner and nothing was there. And then he became obsessed with the upstairs bathroom for some reason. Like whenever Mitch would go in there, he would be at the door just barking and screaming and he would go to the toilet and look in the toilet and bark and all the stuff. And so you know, he's not, Mitch isn't really putting anything together at this point. He's just like, what is this crazy dog doing? I mean, pugs are pretty eccentric and they're, you know, kind of a, kind of a crazy breed, but you know, the dog was acting way stranger than normal. Yeah. Well, so on top of this, Mitch starts to notice, uh, different weird electro electrical anomalies in his house. It was a new house. It, it was, I don't think it was older than like two years at the time, two, three years when, when all this was happening, but uh, the power in an entire room would go out. Okay. If that sounds familiar from the story. Um, he would check the breakers and nothing, you know, the breakers weren't tripped and then the power would come back on. And one day he came in late to work and we were razzing him and he's like, man, my alarm clock just turned off in the middle of the night. Like no other, it was still plugged in and everything else in the house was or everything else in the room was working, but just the alarm clock didn't work. And he just started noticing all this weird stuff. Well, he hadn't really put it all together yet until one day he uh, started to date a new young lady. And when she came over to his house for the first time, she walked in the door and she's like, okay, I know this is going to sound weird, but you have a ghost in your house. Well, it turns out his, his new lady friend was uh, an intuitive okay. for her. The, the veil was thin, and and so she could instantly sense the presence of of this the spirit. And okay. so they they start to talk about it, and just kind of by process of elimination, the 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 his new lady friend figured out that it was the ghost, the spirit of the woman who had been murdered, who when Mitch had kneeled down in front of her and said, "Tell me what happened to you," she had attached to him. And she wasn't haunting the scene where she was murdered. She followed Mitch home. And, you know, we tease Mitch because he's a really handsome guy. And he had uh, lots of girlfriends. And we're like, man, Mitch, even the dead girls are in love with you. <laughs> and I don't know if he really appreciated that too much. But um, you got to look at their spirit, not the dead, <laughs> just the spirit. <laughs> yeah. He took it in stride. But it was it, she followed him home and she stayed at that house. He eventually moved. Uh, a few years later, he bought a new home and she didn't follow him to the new house. Huh. But yeah, she had followed him home. And, you know, when we hear this story, it, it just opens up this possibility because, I mean, we're our, the, the communities that we serve. It's about 200,000 people total with all the cities that we serve. And, you know, we, we don't have a lot of murders here. Right. I mean, there's, you know, too many, one's too many, but yes, you know, we, we do go to a lot of death investigations, people who die of natural causes. And so, I mean, e even for us in a small agency, we could see hundreds of dead bodies a year and you think who's following me home. You know, we're always worried about what <laughs> yes. we're tracking in the house on our boots, you know, like we take <laughs> off when we go on the door, but like what's you know what's going on and and it isn't an isolated incident. There's other colleagues that I know that the ghosts have followed them home as well, what? and so that just opens up this this 
mind-numbing possibility mm-hmm. of what's going on. What occurred with them, in the sense that the spirit followed them home? What experiences? Well, one story I can't tell because okay. some, it, you know, as I gathered <laughs> stories for the book, um, some sto- I, I tried to keep things pretty vague. Okay, like. I, I don't want to, you know, the purpose of my book, I, it's not true crime. I don't really go into a ton of details on the murders, and I keep the names of the victims. I try to keep it really vague. Correct. Correct. Just out of respect for that. Protection, you know, I, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and, you know, I, in the intro to the book, it's like, um, you know, don't, as, you know, the, the details of this might sound familiar, but don't assume you know who it is because patterns, unfortunately, repeat themselves all the time. So there's some stories that I heard that are some of the best ones, but there's no way to make it vague enough that you wouldn't. Oh, know shoot. If, <laughs> if you're so it's like, out of, but out of respect, I mean, I, I really do, you know, the way I approach my job is, you know, I'm there to give voice to the people who've had their voices taken away and I don't want to exploit them at all you know so well can can i ask then maybe in this form uh the weirdest experience you don't have to say who or what but what did they experience well i was i was going to say that one one of the stories one of the other stories where another colleague had a ghost followed home i can tell you i okay. have permission it is okay. in the book. and it's it's kind of it's kind of weird too it was she was a she was a young investigator and she still works with us. Her name is Shanae, and she's a great young investigator. And she had a case once that really hit home to her because the, the it was another murder, and the victim was about her same age. Okay. And the victim had even her taste in clothing. You know, like she had she owned some of the articles of clothing that the victim was wearing when she died. And, you know, there was other similarities that just really gave her this link. And so this case really occupied her thoughts and, and feelings and, and everything. And so one night she's laying in bed and her husband's next to her and she, her husband starts to really struggle and mumble like he's having a nightmare. And, mm-hmm. you know, anyone who's, who's been in a bed with someone having a nightmare can tell what's going on because they jerk and struggle and, you know, you can... So, you know, she's just kind of watching him, um, amused, you know, like, well, what's he doing? I wonder what he's dreaming about. And all of a sudden her husband wakes up, sits up and then yells the name of the victim of the murder that Shanae had been so preoccupied with. Okay. And at that point, you know, Shanae's bemusement went to what the heck and the hair stands up on the back. <laughs> And she's like, what is going on? And he, her husband's like, oh, I just, I just had a dream that, that this, this murder victim was in our room and she was walking towards the bed and she was getting closer and closer. And then she got over on your side of the bed and it was like she was trying to get you. And then I just woke up and shouted her name. And that really freaked her out. Yeah. Because, you know, she had we had talked about these stories and, and she had known about what had happened to Mitch. And so she began to really wonder if that girl hadn't followed her home. And a lot of weird stuff happened at the office and related to it. And so, and this kind of leads me into another observation too, that a lot of uh, paranormal activity with murder victims or deceased victims seems to revolve around their possessions. So we don't have a large-scale evidence storage. We, we collect evidence that we're going to process or package or f- photograph, you know, use some specialty techniques on. And so we'll have evidence for a short term in our office. And it seems, and under certain circumstances, while we have that evidence in our office, there's a spike in weird stuff that happens. And this was the case with the property that belonged to this murder victim that Shanae felt so linked with is there was a lot of kind of weird things that went on with to Shanae at the office, you know, hearing things and, and, 
you know, stuff moving around and seeing stuff out of the corner of your eye and different things. Mm -hmm. And, but as soon as that evidence was all packaged and taken care of and transported and taken away from our office, um, all that kind of activity stopped. Do you think there's a possibility that the victim spirit was upset still during that time period? Yeah, it could be, or just that the, the fact that we had the property that contains blood and tissue and different mm -hmm. things, you know, different elements of them, that that retains a part of their energy or, yeah. I, and, you know, Shanae always felt like she didn't feel like that spirit was angry with her. She felt like she was encouraging her. And, you know, that's why right. when I said, well, when, you're, when your husband had that dream, did he think that she was trying to get you to hurt you or just like get your attention or what? And, and she said, no, he, it was like she was just coming over to me trying to get my attention. Oh, okay. Okay. And and so, you know, maybe she was encouraging her on, like, keep going, you're getting close. We almost got this. I mean <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You maybe, know, who who, yeah. who knows? It, but it was it was an interesting story because yeah, I saw the the pattern once again of a a spirit following a crime scene investigator home and then the, the there was a lot of activity around the evidence. And you know, I've it seems like from different people I've talked to, evidence rooms are a place that often have weird things happen to them. And so, yeah, there, I, there, I think there's something to that, that, yeah, either the spirit's kind of attached to their property or um, there's some energy because a part of them is still on there. But, you know, you hear stories about haunted furniture, or haunted dolls or different things. So, mm -hmm. you know, spirits can be attached to just a piece of property. An item, exactly. Yes, yes. It, it's, uh, I mean, I remember one time I moved into an apartment. It was after the crime scene. I I hope. Uh, <laughs> this apartment, I was in my 20s. It was off of Casino Center Boulevard in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I walked in there and there was like an outline still left by the police of the dead body and there was still like yellow tape saying do not cross the outline well i went back to the landlord and she said well that case is all done you know just do what you want get yourself settled in that apartment it's like what it smells so bad it just took me i tell you uh, there was no spirit there but the smell of that man lingered on for two weeks oh in that yeah. carpet um how do you guys deal with things that, what's the worst scene that you came to as a, a forensic scientist? Like, like uh, the grossest or yeah, the hardest? Yeah, to, yeah. Oh, I'd have to think about that. In 22 <laughs> years, I've seen a lot. I think, I think the, the decomposition scenes where a body's in a high state of decomposition is those are really hard to deal with because mm -hmm. not only is it horrible to look at, but the smells really bad. And there was a case when I was just a pup. I mean, I was, this is probably my first couple of years on the job where it was my first bad decomp scene. And the guy was just melting into his couch mm. and there was flies and maggots everywhere. And, uh, we had respirators on and there, <laughs> there was this old, old time cop who was in there and he didn't have a mask on or anything. And he was just looking at us like, you know, what's up with you college boys with your masks? You know? <laughs> Did your mama give those to him? You know, he was kind of giving us the look. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, half an hour into working the scene or something, all of a sudden he starts to cough and gag and he ran out of the room. Okay. And so we're just kind of looking at each other like, oh, what was that all about? Eh, whatever, you know. Anyway, he comes back in in a few minutes and we're like, hey, you okay? What happened? He's like, Oh, I'm okay. I just swallowed a fly. Oh, God. <laughs> and, you know, I, I look over at the body, and I know where that fly came from because this Ooh. guy had maggots coming out of every orifice, and they're under his skin. And, yeah, it's like, yeah, I know where that fly came from. It came out of him, and you swallowed it. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't don't make fun of our masks. Exactly, exactly. And like like George Carlin says, uh, what does if you can't eat a little bit of germ, the the ten second rule. But this is way past the ten second yes. rule. Yes, uh. because that 
that fly gorged itself and got fat and developed on <laughs> flesh. And, oh, and it was it was weird because it was it was one where when the the people who come and pick up the body lifted him up, he had kind of long hair and his scalp and hair and everything stuck to the pillow and didn't go with him. Ooh. And so I was like, oh, okay. Do I really want to do this job? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. That was probably 20 years ago, so I'm still here. But, <laughs> you know, and, you know, on a serious note, too, I mean, any any of the crimes that deal with children, murdered children, those those are hard. And, you, you know, a lot, of, a lot of stuff you do become jaded and hardened. Mm-hmm two over the years you know now when i see a decomposition like that i don't have that same reaction that i did when i was a rookie but you never get used to seeing a murdered child and it just makes you angry and it's yeah those are really difficult so understandable yeah, but, yes 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 yeah that probably you know if the worst the worst scenes are the ones that deal with kids but can you explain a, a child case of what went on with one um, I don't know. I think probably the most common and, and, you know, th this is, this is maybe a cautionary tale, hopefully to your, your listeners. Exactly. Is, yes. Yes. You know, a, a lot of, a lot of murdered children are the product of alcohol consumption. Okay. Where, um, I don't know if you have kids yourself, but you know, anybody who's had children knows that terrible feeling of you haven't slept for two days and your kid is crying mm -hmm. and they won't be quiet and you're just so frustrated. You just want sleep. And, you know, I've been there the self myself. I have three kids, you know, it's just the, probably the loneliest and the worst feeling in the world. But so many times when you add alcohol into the mix, if you're, uh, it's a lot of times it's the boyfriend, unfortunately it's the, oh. uh, not the biological dad, but it's the, the boyfriend of the mom mm -hmm. and he's drunk and the baby won't stop crying. And then that's when the shaking happens when it's like just that anger, like, why won't you stop crying? And they shake the babies oh. and you know, those babies necks are so soft that just even one or two little shakes and they are, they can be killed. And so, yeah, just if you're, if you're dealing with a crying baby, a colicky baby, don't, have a few brews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dev, that dev all there. And and I, it's a ma ma amazing what anger could do. I mean, it's such it's a in innocent child in that case. And then you have people sometimes that are stupid that may drink and do things that they don't mean to do. Yeah. And it's not good at all. Not good yeah, at all. No. And just a mo, you know, one Fleeting moment of anger like that just ruins so many lives. So, uh, but, but, okay, let's go to some more cheerful ghost story. <laughs> <Do you? laughs> well, I before you ask me, what was the weirdest weirdest story? Yes, and um, this is probably one that I still can't wrap my head around. And uh, once again, the books uh, "Fingerprints and Phantoms" and, uh, and and your website. I'm sorry. We well, um, I don't, I try to talk to everybody through Facebook, okay. so I don't have a specific website. I have an author page on, uh, Amazon. Okay. I love, I would love it if your listeners would reach out to me on Facebook and there's a fingerprints and phantoms, uh, Facebook page, or if you message me just on Paul Ramosh, send me a private message, but I, I try to get back to everybody. I would love to hear your stories, especially, um, those in law enforcement, I'd love to hear some of your stories. Uh, but yeah, look, look, fingerprints and phantoms up on Facebook and reach out to me there. But thank you, Paul. Um, Great. One, one of the, one of the weirdest stories is that it apparently I am haunting my own crime lab. Okay. So, you know, you may actually be interviewing a ghost right now. Maybe I'm not even real. <laughs> I like that idea. Okay, let's, let's continue on with this investigation. Yeah, Richard, you have the best interview ever. This is a groundbreaker. <laughs> but so, well, okay, so here's what happened. So three different, three different coworkers of mine have had experiences where I was not there, but they distinctly heard me. And so the first one happened to 
Angie, she was working alone one night. It was about 2.30, 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning. She was alone in the building. She was working alone that night. She was back in our record room, records room. Mm-hmm. And right behind her, as if I was standing just feet behind her, she hears my voice distinctively say, Angie. And she recognized it at my, as my voice right away. Because it was me, she was not alarmed, like it didn't shock her. She turned around and they fully expected to see me, and I wasn't there. And so she went around, and she's like, hey, Paul, hey, Paulie. And she's walking around the office, looks out, my car's not there, I'm nowhere to be seen. And at that point, she gets freaked out and jumps in her car, and she <laughs> leaves the office with her <laughs> And then it happened again to Shanae. We talked about Shanae earlier. Right, she was right. in, she was in the lab processing some evidence, and there the door was open. And from the front room area where we have our conference table, she heard me call her name. And you know, it's not uncommon for us to drop in the office when we're out doing errands, even when we're not working. We love our we love each other and love our jobs, and so we'll stop by to say hi. So. Once again, you know, this is in the middle of the day. Shanae thinks nothing of it. She's like, oh, Paul's here. And so she, you know, takes off her gloves and walks out. Once again, I'm nowhere to be found. She looks, you know, knocks on the bathroom door, looks out. My car's not there. Nothing. Doesn't see me. Mm -hmm. And then she gets a little freaked out because she distinctly heard my voice. And then the third coworker, she was sitting in her office. And I have a very distinctive sneeze. Uh, I got it from my father. He sneezed like that. I don't know if it was learned or genetic, but I have this really distinctive sneeze. And so uh, Nayeli, she's sitting in her office. She hears me sneeze and it's like, oh, Paul must have came to the office. And she walks once again, nothing. I'm nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. And so it just brings up this really interesting question. So like, I am not dead. Right. The last time I checked. Maybe I am. Maybe <laughs> okay. Once well, again, this is the, you'll you'll get the Pulitzer Prize for this interview. But <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm not dead. But why are why is it that my coworkers are hearing my voice, just mm-hmm. like haunting? Mm-hmm. And you know, I've like I said, I've tried to wrap my mind around it, and and you know, I think it goes more obviously. You know, I'm not dead. It's not a spirit, but it lends some credibility to kind of the tape recorders in stone kind of idea Mm -hmm. that the location can have energy that's trapped somehow and then replays itself multiple times or, you know, was it a ghost impersonating me or like, like who knows? But I just, I don't know. It's really bizarre. And I've never, never really heard stories like that before where someone who's alive is haunting a place. Well, if, if you look at it in this sense, a spirit, our spirit, could be everywhere in every place and there's no such thing as a time reference in that so if you look at it from that viewpoint uh with a lot of energy that we have at times we could be anywhere any place at any time even ahead of us you know even ahead uh like for an example there's been times that my mom's energy has been so strong She's still alive, but I felt her something going on, something wrong. So I had to give her a call. Same thing with my girlfriend. Uh, same thing with uh, my dad, even, who I don't speak to once once a month. But <laughs> no matter who it is, if their energy is strong, whether they're alive or gone, I believe we still feel them. Yeah, or, or could it be like a, a hiccup in space-time or yes, something? Yes, yes. You know, like, or... Could it be a multiverse, you know, bleeding mm-hmm. over? Like, I mean, there's just, there's all these possibilities. And once again, I, I can't, you know, they, they experience something. I mean, these three, these three coworkers are mine or dear friends. They know my voice. They, they, no one else was there. It's not like someone, they just heard someone else talking and they thought it was me or, you know, Rich Little. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes. You know, it's like they heard something. And I can't tell them they didn't, and I wouldn't. But what is it? I, I don't know. And so, to me, maybe I don't even ever want to know. I mean, like I said, I love kind of the the mystery in life and unsolved things. And it really is the color and 
you know, seasoning of life, things like that. And so I don't know. It's 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 a cool story. And yeah, it that's is. Probably it is. I can't make. I can't wrap my head around it. <laughs> Sometimes we we just can't. Sometimes there's things we just have to accept and be open to, like what you're going through. Um, but I'm glad that you've had some time to share this with us and express how you feel about it. I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you having me on. It has been great. And we're, I love to do the other show with you as well. We're still taping, of course. Uh, <laughs> we're still going to be broadcasting right now. So why don't we, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close the show? Um, I would just love to say if, you know, to your listeners out there, I love hearing these stories. Um, and there's so many interesting things that happen to law enforcement people because they are around death. They work late nights. They're in secluded areas. They deal with high stress situations. Um, it, it's, it's funny the the, the officers that I've talked to, I think I mentioned this at the beginning. At mm -hmm. first, a lot of them were a little kind of reticent to share their stories. But when they saw that I was serious, I mean, the floodgates opened up. And I find, it, you know, the people around here, I found it. it's more rare that an officer hasn't experienced something strange than they had. And, mm -hmm. you know, what, what it all meant, they, they weren't sometimes sure. And, you know, they just told me and, you know, told me as it was, but you know, something's happening out there. And so I would love to hear your stories. Reach out to me on uh, fingerprints and phantoms, my Facebook page. I would love to hear what's happening to everybody out there. That will be great. Thank you. And if you need Paul's information as well, you can reach me at uh, funny spassoff at gmail.com or my website. If you need any information about Paul or any of our other shows, and I really appreciate Paul being here to tonight. Thank, thank you, Paul. All right. Thank you. And we, we got to get together again because I need yes. to tell you about Montezuma's lost treasure. That's a great story too. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on for a minute. And let's, uh, again, I, I like to thank everybody for listening to the Richard Spassoff show with Paul Remosh. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Richard Spazoff Show. For more episodes and information, join us online at PsychicMediumSpazoffShow.com or catch the show on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. The Richard Spazoff Show is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more great content and shows, visit HCUniversalNetwork.com or download our free HC Universal Network podcast app from your favorite device market. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And until next time, keep, keep watching watch on the dark darkness. Dark, dark, dark.